We're immensely blessed in the people who have traveled to be with us uh, today and to help us in our thinking about uh, different aspects of partnership and mission. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, especially John and Olive Drain. John is going to speak to us now and Olive uh, later in the day. Uh, they've traveled, uh, f uh, or they live near Aberdeen, uh, and I'm not sure, have you traveled from there? Uh, to, yeah, they have, uh, to, which is uh, a, a long uh, journey indeed. So welcome uh, among us. Uh, John is going to give our first uh, address now. Uh, for those of you who not come across uh, John, uh, he is a uh, uh, a biblical theologian and a student uh, and teacher and writer uh, on mission. Uh, he has uh, been uh, hugely influential in his books and his writings, in his observation on what's happening in contemporary culture, in the ways the church are engaging with that, not only uh, in Great Britain and Ireland, but uh, across the world in the United States uh, and elsewhere. And his books have been uh, extremely helpful uh, to me in helping me understand uh, some of what's going on uh, in the church and in the world and enormously stimulating. So it's a huge pleasure to welcome them both here and to welcome John in particular to speak to us now. John, thank you. You're welcome to welcome them. Okay, thank you, uh, Stephen. And uh, after that little hiccup, uh, nothing else can go wrong, can it? <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, how did I end up being here in Sheffield on a Saturday morning talking about mission, partnership, and the Bible? What do I actually know about that topic? And my mind went back to a time some of you here will possibly remember the late 1980s and the early 1990s when the government of the UK decided that it would be a good idea to regenerate old industrial land and to do it through the medium of garden festivals. Does anybody remember the day of garden festivals? Obviously I'm the oldest person here then, aren't I? <laughs> well, I shall never forget this particular garden festival in Glasgow because um, at the time I was in two places. At the time I was recovering, as was Olive, from a tragedy in our lives when we lost one of our children unexpectedly. Olive's story as how she got out of that dark hole is told in her book Clown Storytellers and Disciples. My story is rather different because I was lifted out of a dark place by God in a church committee. So those of you who feel you're trapped in church committees, it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative experience. This was a church committee, it was an ecumenical committee. It was the mission committee of all the Scottish churches together and um, I became the chairperson of it. And as part of that, I discovered that I'd inherited a committee whose history and origins went way back beyond my lifetime, in fact, and uh, back to the time when Billy Graham had visited Scotland. And the remnants of this committee didn't know how to sh shut themselves down after he'd been, and he only visited once. They didn't know how to close themselves down, and so they drifted on like many church committees, not knowing what to do next, spending hours to write minutes and more agendas, and I inherited this committee which was full of the great and good of the Scottish churches because every denomination had sent official representatives to it. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, my remit is either to close this committee down with decency and in order or else to find a new agenda for us. And just at that time, in the late 1980s, over the horizon came the possibility, the certainty indeed, that there would be a garden festival to regenerate old industrial shipyard land in the city centre of Glasgow. And I remember going to a meeting that was called by the people who were going to do this. They invited the captains of industry, the leaders of commerce, and representatives of the church, and I was it. 
and we listened as they told us, if you have a product to promote in Scotland in this year, we would like you to do it at the Garden Festival in Glasgow. And so I went back to my committee and I said, here is a remarkable missional opportunity. What are we going to do about it? And they said, sounds like a great idea, John. Why don't you do something about it? You've been in those committees as well, obviously. So I remember a dark, dreary, miserable, grey winter's day, driving to Glasgow with Olive to meet the chief executive of what was to be the Garden Festival. Uh, we knew where he was because this was in the days before smoking was banned in public places and we could identify his office, a porter cabin, by the volumes of smoke coming out of it. He was a chain smoker and we were ushered in to meet him at the appointed hour and uh, the first thing he said was, you need to understand that I'm not a Christian. But since I know there are quite a few Christians in Scotland, I'm going to have to be nice to you. Now, we went with this in mind. Wouldn't it be good if in some little corner of this 120-acre site, we could have a corner where we could have a service on some Sunday, probably, because that's what we knew how to do. And so we went and we had this tentative conversation. And he said, well, Easter's already spoken for, so that's out. And in his mind, that was the only Christian day that he knew anything about. So he said, we can't possibly let you do that at Easter. Is there another day that means something for people like you? And so completely spontaneously, as I recall, one of us or both of us said, well, how about Pentecost? And he looked aghast and he thought, that's not Pentecost tells, is it? Because we don't want to go there, probably. Um, what is that about? And I remember sitting in this smoke-filled office, sharing with him the story from the Book of Acts of the first Pentecost. And as we finished sharing that story, this is what he said. He said, wow, I've never heard that story before. But if it's as exciting as you guys are saying, you don't just need a small corner to have a service for an hour. He said, how about if I give you the whole 120 acre site for a whole day on Pentecost Sunday? He said, there would be just one condition. He said, I need to provide 140 program hours in places like restaurants and bars and outdoors and entertainment. He said, if you can get your people to do that, he said, I'd even pay you for it because I have a budget for every day. And we sat there in this smoke-filled office. By now, we'd extended the invitation. We were there longer than he anticipated us being there. And um, we said, oh, yes, yes, of course we can. Of course there are talented, creative Christians in all the Scottish churches. We can do your 140 program hours, no bother at all. And then we're driving back home through the rain and the grey day and looking at each other when I should have been looking at the road and saying, what have we done? Well, fast forward six, eight months or whatever, and the day came. We did indeed deliver our 140 program hours. Some amazingly creative and talented people who would otherwise be unrecognized and unnoticed in their churches came out of the woodwork. We did indeed have church choirs in some places. We had groups of school children in other places. We had someone who called himself a comic evangelist, a bit like sort of Billy Connolly with spiritual attitude, <laughs> and all sorts of other things. 68,000 people attended on that single day and at the end of the season we got a prize and a gold medal from the UK government because that was the largest single attendance of any day of the Glasgow Garden Festival. But the thing I want to say is this. As I drove home looking at Olive and saying, what have we done? I thought, hey, the Missio Dei isn't just something I've read about in a book. God really is active in mission. Because you see, where did the vision for that day come from? Well, my vision and the vision of my church committee 
The vision of my ecumenical committee was very small. Can we have a small corner to have a service? And this guy, who specifically said he wasn't a Christian, said, well, actually, if the good news of the gospel is as great as you say, if it's as exciting and excited as you are talking to me, you need to think big. And actually, it was through the agency of somebody who said, I'm not a Christian. It was that partnership that actually led to those people being there on that day, to that opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ in a different environment. And actually, for many people in the Scottish churches, that was a point at which they pointed can point back in their lives to say that they saw new possibilities and new insights into what mission might look like. For me, I think it was the day when I was converted to thinking missionally. It was the day when the things I was supposed to know as a theological educator suddenly came off the pages of the Bible and meant something in real life. That all this talk about God being, God really is in mission. God really was working there. God was actually ahead of the game, big time. And I think as I reflect on the whole question of partnership, thinking what does that mean, then that would be my paradigm and my starting point. Because I didn't always think like that. Why did I miss it? I mean, why was I surprised? The answer is, I haven't a clue. Because it's there on the first page of the Bible. Um, had I missed it somehow? I sometimes wonder whether my problem was that I knew the right answers to all the questions that were asked. And actually I missed what God was doing because I knew the right answers, whereas God knew the right questions and the new opportunities and possibilities that were opening before us. So where to start thinking about this? Well, Genesis chapter 1, I've already mentioned it. The story you know in great familiarity. The story of how God creates and God's creation is celebrated through the various aspects of the world around us. And uh, there's a sort of poetic pattern there, isn't there? That it begins with a statement that out of formlessness and chaos, God brings order. And then for the next few days, God says something like, let there be, or God made, or God did. And all of them end with God saw it was good. But then significantly comes the point where humans are introduced into the picture. And have you noticed when you've read that passage that there's a significant shift in terminology? Because God doesn't just make or do. God does indeed say it's good. But in one of those shifts that's significant precisely because it's intended to be significant, God says, let us make humankind, Genesis 1, A sentence that's intended to tell us at least as much about God as it does about human nature. Telling us that in some deeply foundational way, relationship is the one thing that defines the very core of who and what God is. And this is not just relationship in some sort of abstract, propositional, disconnected kind of way but it's relationship with a practical intentionality and definable outcomes. And so humankind emerges in the poem as the penultimate of God's creating activities. I say the penultimate one because actually the final one in there is God just loving what's being created. Is God taking pleasure in the outcome and God resting? And sometimes we forget that in ministry is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to have an element of recreation, an element of building up, an element of nurture, an element of excitement at what is coming to birth in our midst. Now, there are many things in this passage that are complex and puzzling, as I'm sure you know. There's that wonderful combination of simplicity and paradox that, to be honest, characterizes and ought to char characterize everything that we think we know about God. Um, in recent years, as I'm sure you're aware, much theological ink has been spilled, asking that question, who is God talking about? Who is God talking to when the word is, let us make humankind? Who are the us? And how many of them were there anyway? 
Is it the singular figure of Sophia, identified in much wisdom literature as being alongside God as a master craftsperson? Or um, and that in some way balances the symmetry between male and female of the human race with s similar imagery of what's going on in the person of God? Or was it more complex than that? Is it somehow a kind of foreshadowing, a foretaste, a signpost towards what later became the understanding of the Trinity? Well, I'm not going to explore either of those today, though I could have plenty to say about them. What I'm going to say is that two facts as we reflect on that story, the very first page of the Bible, and therefore I would like to think it's quite important, because most books put the important stuff on the first page. Um, two things stand out as unchallenged. One is that God is very mysterious, and the second is that God is relational. Those two facts impinge on who we are meant to be as Christians. Because, of course, by its insistence that we as human beings are made in God's image, this passage is also saying that to be fully human, we need to be relational. And I don't know about you, but I think we can also be very mysterious at times. But let's stick with the relational aspect for now. Because we're meant to be relational, not just in a disconnected, abstract kind of way, but actually to be intentionally relational. So Adam and Eve, they're given the job, partner with God in the garden, so as to cherish and preserve the rest of creation, and partner with each other in order to do so. Now you could say that partnership, collaboration, mutuality therefore, these are all at the very heart of what it means to be truly human as God intended us to be. Moreover, when we think about partnership in a theological or a Christian or a biblical context, partnership operates in multiple directions, between God and people, between people and the wider environment, between people and other people, and specifically notice in this passage, women and men working together as equals because we're all made in the image of God, mirroring and depending on the most fundamental partnership of all, which is that internal partnership and collaboration within the person of God that is both transparent and mysterious all at one and the same time. And as I reflect on that and how that story informs the whole of the rest of the biblical tradition, this divine human partnership takes central stage, doesn't it? So Abraham's family, a few chapters later, is invited to partner with God. You'll be pleased to know, incidentally, I'm not going to go through every book of the Bible in the next uh, 40 minutes. And uh, the promise is, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we know that that aspiration was easier said than done. As one generation after another struggles to fulfill God's divine mandate. Now in that cultural context, of the ancient world, individualism, in the sense that we know it today, was really not known at all. But what was very strongly evident was the kind of tribal exclusivism that actually we still struggle with very much today in our world. And as we read the biblical story, it's clear that the divine human partnership was never really lost, but the most challenging and problematic thing was the missional understanding that lay behind partnership. Because it's possible for us to explore partnership with all sorts of other people and organizations and institutions, and the partnership itself becomes the center of our focus. Whereas God is always inviting us to look outwards, to look forwards. The kingdom of God in Jesus' teaching invites us not to imagine, not to rake over the ashes of the past, not even to stay content with the present, but continually to be asking, what might God's future look like? What might we be instrumental in bringing to birth under the guidance of God's Holy Spirit? And um, the prophets continually highlight the ambiguity and contradictions and the difficulties of people grasping this. This spirituality so easily becomes introverted, tribalistic, a way of excluding others, rather than including them. And so we find some leading Old Testament figures struggle with this. Jonah is sent to Nineveh 
He doesn't want to go because they're nasty people. They've done lots of bad things to his people in the past, so why should he be bothered in any kind of missional partnership with people like that? Or Ezra, who in a similar period of history was seriously bothered by the possibility of his people losing their identity. What if we partner with these alien people, in his case a different ethnicity, will we somehow dilute who we are as the people of God? These are all questions that will float around in today's world as we engage in missional partnerships, not just with one another, but with the broader culture. And um, whether we like it or not, through the centuries, God's people have struggled to embrace the wide expansiveness of God's loving concern, whether it's in relation to the empire building days of Christendom or more prosaically in our churches today where we find it hard to embrace people whose style of worship is different than ours or their methodology of social engagement or indeed their theological conviction or quite often they don't dress like us so how can we possibly accept and be partners with them and if the idea of partnering with Christians who are not like us can be challenging enough then it often becomes much more problematic when we move into territory occupied by others. Not long after that event in the Glasgow Garden Festival, Olive and I had a visitor. Came to Scotland from Geneva in Switzerland, where he was Evangelism Secretary of the World Council of Churches. This was Raymond Fung, whose book, The Isaiah Vision, is uh, one of the inspirations behind the whole concept of missional partnerships in the wider culture. And uh, I remember talking with Raymond as we walked around one of the Scottish locks about the possibilities of applying this vision from Isaiah 65 as a model for mission partnerships in the 21st century. That was 20 years ago. Tells you something about um, how slowly sometimes we move in order to catch up with the movements of our culture. But I think Raymond's book, The Isaiah Vision, and you're going to be encouraged to read it if you've not read it already, um, is one of the very few books on mission that I know that invites us to ask, what does a true missional partnership look like, especially when we operate through the spectacles of the Missio Dei? This understanding that this is God's world, therefore God is at work in the world, therefore there can be no no-go areas for God, therefore we can expect to find God at work wherever we look to form partnerships with people who share gospel values, people who want the world to become a better place, and with whom we can journey. Not long after that episode in the Glasgow Garden Festival, Olive and I found ourselves working with Raymond for quite a few years and um, as we travelled around the world with schools of evangelism with the World Council of Churches. And uh, Raymond's vision came out of his deep engagement with the culture of his own native Hong Kong. As he engaged in industrial mission there in the 1980s and 90s and discovered that there were indeed people of peace, such as Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 10, who were up for engaging in the conversation and with whom it was possible to have a missional engagement. The subtitle of Raymond's book is Ecumenic An Ecumenical Strategy for Congregational Evangelism, which highlight two features as we reflect, as I reflect on the whole question of missional partnerships. First of all, he's using the word ecumenical in its original meaning. Everything in the whole world, not just we'll be nice to other Christians, but actually asking that question, what is God doing? And recognizing mission is about getting alongside what God is already doing. And then, surprisingly, you might think, the word evangelism features in the title, because that's what we're talking about. How are people to be invited to follow Jesus in faithful discipleship in the context of our 21st century culture? And um, this is why Raymond can be so confident in insisting that effective missional partnerships can be forged not just with people like us, not just between parishes, 
but actually with anyone of goodwill, the people of peace that Jesus mentions in the Gospels. I know some people who have hesitations about this, and they say to me, well, actually, you can't really put light in the same context as darkness. How can we actually partnership with, partner with people who are different than us? Well, actually, when you read the Bible carefully, you'll discover that people are no different than us. Maybe one of our challenges is that we've created this image that we're different, which often comes across as we're better. That's what people mean, I think, when they say, as they sometimes do, but you Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. When I've unpacked that with people who are not Christians and people who say it, I discover that they don't usually mean we're bad people. Actually, they usually say, well, actually, the church has done lots of good things. Actually, there are loads of charitable works that wouldn't exist without Christians being involved in them. Actually, you are making a difference. But why do you pretend that you don't struggle with the same things as we do? Why do you give this image that your relationships are all fine, that everything in your lives just sails along in a straight line? Now, maybe it's because my life as a theologian, as a parent, as a husband, was rudely interrupted by the death of my daughter, that I was forced to think of those questions and to realize that actually my life is on the same knife edge as everybody else's, that we as Christians struggle with the same things, that my relationships could go down the tubes overnight, just the same as many other people's. And when we recognize our common humanity, rooted in the scripture that we're all made in the image of God, women and men together, and I might add different ethnicities and backgrounds and cultures and so on, that's when effective missional partnerships can begin to be formed. And um, so we find that in Raymond Fung's case, for example, and I'm emphasizing Raymond because I know you're going to be ex um, encouraged to read his book as part of this process in the diocese. Um, Raymond tells some wonderful stories in that book. He tells of how, and remember this is in a communist dominated context we're talking about. This is a very unchristian context of how he was able to identify people of peace espousing Christian kingdom values, even when they didn't know that's what they were very often. And he tells many stories of how they got to the end of a meeting or stuck in a meeting and nobody knew where to get go next. And Raymond would say, well actually, when as Christians we get into this kind of fix, we would pray about it, just like that. And more often than not, in completely unchristian contexts, and I've seen this happen myself, um, they said, well, would you like to pray for us? Would you like to pray with us? Because actually we've done everything else and we don't know what to do next. So actually, Raymond found, and we have found over the years, that there's a deep sense of search for Christian spirituality and an embrace of what it actually means to be Christian. And sometimes one of our challenges and our problems, I think, in forging effective missional partnerships with the wider culture is that we play down the reality of our Christian spirituality. That actually we do pray, or we should pray, when things get tough. The reality that a vast majority of the population, they do pray when things get tough. And very large numbers of them pray when things are not tough as well. And um, there's something here that we need to begin to reflect on and to explore. Of course, before we dismiss entirely the questions raised by Old Testament characters like Jonah or Ezra, I need to admit that the same questions might well arise today because their questions were real and genuine. You see, in the case of Jonah, it concerned, how can I work with people who persecuted me? These nasty people. I mean, how can God's grace possibly extend to them? How can I deal with them? What's wrong with you, God, that you want me to deal with these nasty people who are against you? And God's message of grace and love says, well, actually, you need to begin to see things the way I see them, Jonah. And when we see them through the eyes of God, and more precisely through the spectacle of the cross in the New Testament, things look different. For Ezra, who had issues of what today we would call contextualization, 
and when that becomes syncretism. I mean, how do we sort that stuff out? Because both of these issues are likely to be significant issues for the 21st century as we move forward. But then all this is deeply embedded, is it not, in the story of Jesus? Because when you think about it, missional partnerships, was there a more remarkable missional partnership than the partnership between God and humanity, the Divine Spirit and the Blessed Virgin, in that thing we call the Incarnation? I mean, how mysterious is that? How incomprehensible is it? And yet that challenging affirmation is at the very center of our faith. Interestingly, not that God came into the world as a fully formed adult, but God came into the world as a child with all the vulnerabilities and opportunities that that implies. One of which must be that before he embarked on public ministry, Jesus was in the hands of human carers. And the partnership of those carers was vital if the divine plan was ever to come to fruition. I mean, isn't that the ultimate missional partnership? So we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus challenges some of these commonly understood impressions of what a divine partnership might look like. He embraces the wrong sort of people, the marginalized, the unreligious, the sinners, the outcasts, troublemakers. And much of the imagery Jesus uses in the Gospels is about partnership. He invites people to parties, to journeys, to banquets, to conversations. And the gospel invitation can be summed up as an invitation to partnership. You know, Jesus meets those fishing people by the shore of Galilee, and he says to them, here's this big vision. He, this, the world could be different, and this is what it could look like. If you're up for this vision, let's hang out together and see what happens next. I mean, that was the call of the gospel. I've often reflected as I've, as I've heard more restricted definitions of what it means to be a disciple and to follow Jesus. Would any of those fishing people qualify in some of our churches today? Because what did they believe? What did Jesus invite them to believe? He invited them to a journey and said, if you're up for this vision of God's kingdom, the world renewed and human nature refreshed and revived, then let's hang out together and see what happens. And of course in the process, he asked them leading questions like, what if, have you thought about, how about something else? But they first of all got on the journey and experienced being with Jesus, and it was out of that that they discerned what they might, in our terms, believe in order to be his disciples. And being in partnership with Jesus like this can be challenging because you see there are unpredictable outcomes. What if discipleship for somebody else doesn't look identical to what it is for me? What if I find myself on the wrong side of those who seem to be somebody? What if I face tough questions of truth as I engage with the wider world? As Peter did at Caesarea Philippi, or life-threatening moral choices, think Peter in the high priest's garden, but all along the way, the question that Jesus insistently asks is, come and follow me, hang out with me. Let's see where God is gonna take us on this unknown adventure. And this is not something we can do alone. It's not even something a small group can do. And so the disciples are sent off to multiply, whether it's 12 of them, 70 of them, or later the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. Some people will say to me, yeah, but what about the early church? I mean, what about that St. Paul? I mean, isn't he bucking the trend of what you're on about? I mean, surely he was the individualist par excellence, that single-minded entrepreneur who went out and did his own thing and in the process didn't care what anybody else did very much because he was always right. And we know a few of them, don't we? Well, actually, as I reflect on St. Paul, Sure, he was an entrepreneur. Sure, he was a visionary. And yet, from start to finish of his story, he goes out of his way to emphasize partnership in mission. I mean, one of the very earliest stories about Paul is how the church in Antioch sent for him through Barnabas in order to be a partner with them as they were reaching out, as they were connecting with people who I imagine were people like him, 
who took them out of their comfort zone as Hellenistic people. And they needed Paul to be in partnership with them in order to explore that bit of their missional opportunity. The next couple of chapters, we find him and that church partnering with the church in Jerusalem. I mean, if you read the story, the church in Antioch was about as different from the church in Jerusalem as chalk from cheese. They were entirely different in their ethos, their makeup, and quite likely their theology as well. Um, but partnership was vital to the church in Antioch. They wouldn't see the church in Jerusalem suffer and starve at a time of famine. And uh, then later on, partnership with churches that were quite different is central to St. Paul. I mean, the end of his life, why does he make that journey back to Jerusalem? Because he knows that the Jerusalem church could do with help, they need effective missional partnerships, and he makes a collection in that case from the churches in Asia Minor and goes back to Jerusalem with it. Um, and in between, there are partnerships with many personal friends, as well as addressing some big issues. So Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, which is one of the core texts, I think, for Paul's concept of partnership, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, not just we're all one in Christ Jesus, but we're all partners in Christ Jesus. And though all three of those have been argued about exhaustively, and one of them at least is still being argued about in some bits of the church today, as I look at that, I think, well, the one that Paul could make most practical headway on in his context, breaking down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles, he did a huge amount to do that. It would have been more difficult for him to dismantle the whole structure of slavery in the first century because that was the equivalent of um, the employment laws, if you like, in 21st century Britain. He did a huge amount, I think, to break down the question of unequal partnerships between women and men because he knew also something that we are just beginning to learn that we can do more when we work with others than when we try and do it all by ourselves in our small corners. When you think of it, he had a missional strategy as well. His strategy, if you trace the journeys that he made, what were the places that he visited? Well, the places he visited were all provincial capitals. He went to key strategic places of communication and he anticipated that God would be there ahead of him. So he absolutely took it for granted that groups of disciples would be brought to birth in these places. He knew that was what was going to happen as he was in mission. But he also knew that these would be the people who would take the message into more remote places. And he trusted them. And he was in partnership with them. We have the epistle of Colossians in the New Testament. Paul never visited Colossae. The church in Colossae was founded by one of his converts in Ephesus, who immediately became a partner with Paul in the apostolic mission. I think that tells us something about leadership in today's church as well, because actually quite often we lose the emphasis of the enthusiasm and the excitement and the insights and connections of people newly come to faith. And quite often we say to them, or the system appears to say to them when they look at the people who are leaders, you're not going to get very far here till you're 40, sometimes in some of our churches 50 or even 60. Nothing wrong with old people. I'm not a spring chicken myself. But you get the message. Paul was trusting people, engaging in part. So the people who were his converts one day become his partners in mission the next week. An interesting combination of independence and mutuality. And um, Paul's experience also highlights some of the challenges of working this way. I've already mentioned that he took the collection from Asia Minor to Jerusalem. Actually, that was what led to his death. I've often wondered if he hadn't made that journey to Jerusalem if he hadn't been fired up with this divine necessity for a partnership between the Gentile churches and the Jewish churches and how important that was in the grand scheme of things, presumably 
he, well, he certainly wouldn't have been arrested in the setting he was, would he have lived for longer? What would have happened? Would he have been an even greater missionary than we think he is today? Well, of course, hopefully our partnerships won't end like that. But it does remind us there's often going to be difficulty and danger associated with any missional enterprise. There will be those in our churches as well as in the wider culture who prefer to live within the boundaries of tribalism rather than engaging in the sort of partnership that's at the heart of divine mission. So where does all this bring us to? Well, I think to wrap this up, in the past, partnerships between parishes or other agencies working together have often been brought about by financial or other extraneous pressures, rather than a sense that actually this is what we should be doing. Now, there's no need for us to rewrite history, and I'm going to resist the temptation to do that. I think there's far too much talk in churches today raking over the ashes of the past, trying to allocate blame as to who's to blame for where we've got ourselves into. The gospel is about new birth, it's about new life. It's constantly asking, who might we now become, not who have we been? Because actually, as I reflect on what now look like mistakes of a hundred years ago, I'm pretty sure if I'd been there at the time, I would have done exactly the same things, and we'll be making some mistakes ourselves today. But the call of the gospel is continually to look forward and to look outwards and to ask who is God calling us to be in the 21st century and what does that look like in the context of our ever-changing culture. Um, parishes emerged as they did in self-contained um, modules, as it were, for very good reasons. There was little mobility in the population at one time, whereas today's world is different. John Wesley famously said, the world is my parish. Well, actually today, for many people, as you know only too well, the parish is the whole world. As different cultures, different ways of doing things, different ethnicities and so on, move into our places. So there is a very big practical question as to what collaborative mission might look like. Um, but that's not the whole story. And I don't think it's even the most important bit of the story. Which brings me back to where we started, the question of the Missio Dei. I suppose a hundred years ago, nobody would have heard of those words. For those of you who never did Latin, they are Latin, by the way. Though actually we sung a bit of Latin earlier on, so you all know some Latin. Actually, when you go back to your churches and people say, what did you learn today? Well, you can say, I learned some Latin, even if everything else was rubbish, can't you? Um, but, um, Missio Dei, mission of God. God is the one who is in mission. And there's no question that you see that that's highlighted the importance of partnership. First of all, by reminding us what I discovered back in that conversation with the person at Glasgow Garden Festival, that actually the Missio Dei, this notion that God is in mission, it's not just something in a book. It's not even something in a book as important as the Bible. It's very deeply embedded in what God actually does in our world today. But it also reminds us from our angle, I think, that if God is the one who's in mission and God is actually moving in people's lives, and I see evidence and signs of this all over the place, um, mission is an invitation to get alongside what God is already doing, which by definition is an invitation to be in partnership with God in person. And since this is God's world, and God is at work in the world, then presumably there can be no no-go areas for God. That is the big challenge, I think, is that third statement. There can be no no-go areas for God. Christians are continually challenging me on this one because I spent too much time with spiritual seekers and psychics and oddball people that you meet in mind-body-spirit festivals. Well, actually, if there are no go areas for God, who is God? I mean, what sort of God is that? Who is excluded from various bits of our experience as human beings in today's world? Which raises the other questions of Jonah and Ezra and so on. One of my favorite mission statements comes from a group who were 
one of the earliest, I was going to say one of the earliest fresh expressions, but they came into existence before fresh expressions was thought of in that sense, Sanctus I in Manchester. And the days when they were worshipping in Manchester Cathedral, they described their mission like this. They said, we believe that God is already in the world and working in the world. We wish to affirm and enjoy the parts of our culture that give a voice to one of the many voices of God and challenge any areas that deafen the call of God and hence constrain human freedom. And as I reflect on that, affirm and enjoy the parts of our culture that give a voice to one of the many voices of God, challenge those areas that deafen the call of God, isn't that what we're called to in missional partnerships today? That's the mission that we're called to, to affirm those whose values reflect what my friend Ian Fraser calls God's way of doing things, which is his definition of the terminology of the kingdom, and to challenge other ways of being. That's what's at the heart of Raymond Fung's vision, which is the Isaiah vision based on Isaiah chapter 65. And today it's not just Christians who are coming to realize the importance of partnerships. I mean, as we speak, the US government is in a mess, I think, is the kindest thing I can say. Um, that's what lots of my American friends are saying. Why has it got into this state? Well, actually, because they don't know how to partner with each other. And the whole mess that it's created is so obvious. Our politicians, because of our structure of our system, are more forced to partner with each other because it wouldn't be possible for them to close the government down in the way that happens in the US. Um, but partnership is at the heart of what it means to be human and to live effectively the good life in the 21st century. Now when you think about it, and this has already been referred to actually in the prayer statements that uh, Bishop Stephen led us in earlier on, St. Paul's image of the body in which everyone has a part to play and in different circumstances their roles might be very different. It means that some things in terms of missional partnerships will be done better locally. It means some will be done better through wider collaboration. Some by individuals in specialized environments, others operating in groups. But giving and receiving is always going to be central because giving and receiving in partnership is fundamental to what it means to be human. It not only creates community, but it helps to sustain these re relationships in a healthy way. And I think that's one of the other challenges we face as we move forward in missional partnerships, is that being prepared to receive something is at least as important as being ready to give something. And some of our more successful churches might need to learn to receive the gifts that others who look more struggling, shall I say, might actually have discovered some things that the rest of us need to know about. Because all of us are of value as we put our skills and talents on the table. I want to end here with um, three quotations which sum up why I feel about all this. First of all, the inspirational one, Daniel Pink, was Bill Clinton's speechwriter, still is Bill Clinton's speechwriter. And in his book, A Whole New Mind, he writes this, what we need now are creators and empathizers, pattern recognizers and meaning makers, artists, storytellers, caregivers, consolers, big picture thinkers. One of the questions I put down for you to talk about later on is who are these people and where will we find them? second one that um, comes from a book called The Cultural Creatives, and this really sums up where I feel I'm at, by Paul Ray and Sherry Ruth Anderson. At times, they write, the journey feels awkward or perilous. You're asking questions that everyone wishes would go away. You don't know how to put into words what you're searching for. You're wondering just how big an idiot you really are for leaving what felt sure and safe and comfortable though all this is tempered by the freshness and exhilaration of setting out a new territory. I find that both exciting and challenging and threatening and liberating 
all at one and the same moment, asking questions everyone wishes would go away. Not quite sure how to put it all into words. How big an idiot really are you going to end up looking? Actually, that's the call of the gospel. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about when he says, pick up your cross and follow me? Yep. You might look like an idiot. You might not know where the journey is going to end. You might find that there are difficulties and problems along the way, but it's the freshness and exhilaration of setting out for new territory, asking, who is God? What partnerships is God engaging in in today's world? Who might we yet become if we follow the wind of the Spirit? Amen. John, thank you very much for such a stimulating and helpful beginning to the day. The whole uh, sweep of the scripture you gave us, the insight into the mission of God, uh, the call to partnership, and uh, the windows into our contemporary culture. And I'm sure we'll be processing that as we go through the day in our dialogue together, informally over coffee, and in some of the other sessions during the day. And there'll be a chance to think about the questions that John has asked us later and also to ask back and to reflect questions uh, later as well.